Hey friends, before this video gets started, I wanted to just throw out a little personal message off the cuff and spontaneous. Be safe, people. Please, be safe. Take this stuff seriously, okay? And I'm not just saying that as a general rule. We are staying in because my wife and I are both seriously compromised in our immune system. She even more so than I am. And this stuff could kill us both. Like that. I'm not crazy about that idea. I got too much stuff to do. And I cannot, cannot live without her. I have always been able to take on whatever life threw at me, but I don't know that I could do it anymore if I lost her. She is my mainstay. She is my anchor. She's my rock. She's my conscience. She's my best friend. So, everybody, if you have somebody like that, please be safe and keep your butt inside and keep them safe, okay? Take this seriously. And now, on to the video. Since when has news been entertainment? Since it was invented? Hi, welcome to Single Shots, where we take a look at some classic TV series that are too long or too complicated or too weird to review my usual way. So we examine the series as a whole and try to figure it out. Today's topic, the time is 20 minutes into the future. Television is basically all there is, and the competition between stations is so fierce, ratings are monitored by the second. Our subject is Edison Carter, played by Matt Frewer. He's a hard-hitting investigative reporter who's not above bending the rules or even putting himself in danger to get the story. His camera is his lifeline because it continuously transmits images and sound to his control person back at headquarters. Control has access to everything. How to get in a building past security, where the guards are, schematics of the building, you name it, Control has it. But let's back up for a moment. The first episode isn't where all this started. Max Headroom made his first appearance in a 1985 made-for-television movie that I have not been able to find a working copy of. But it really doesn't matter for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. After the movie, he spent the next two years in the UK performing as the world's first totally computer-generated TV host. He had an entire variety show with guests and the whole bit. All from a host who was nothing but a very advanced computer program. Except he was nothing of the kind. I got my first personal computer in 1988, and I happen to know computers of that time couldn't do this. That idea is backed up by the fact that they didn't. There was no Max Headroom. He was actor Matt Frewer in heavy prosthetics. They used film tricks to get the little stu 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 stutters and glitches, and there you were. Before long, he was doing commercials and such in the U.S., and suddenly we needed a TV show. Well, we already had that first movie, so why not build on that? Better yet, why not just do some minimal rewrite and then completely reshoot that same script? That's a lot easier than coming up with a whole new plot and story and all that nonsense. That's why it won't be necessary to try and find that first movie in order to make this a complete review. We have it right here, slightly reworked in the first episode. In this dystopian world, television and corporations rule everything. Outside the Towers of Privilege, we see people living on the streets, keeping warm around burning barrels, and eating cooked rats that they get from street vendors. The areas where they live are called the fringes, and most of the people call themselves blanks. As far as the wider universe is concerned, they don't exist. By one means or another, they've managed to remove themselves from the global computer system, so there's no record of them anywhere. Television is people's only outlet, and there are sets everywhere because the government hands them out to the poor. A vacant lot covered in garbage where human beings scrounge for little scraps that might be edible. You'll see anywhere from three to a dozen TV sets sitting around, all glowing with the images of the day. And you can't turn them off. Off switches are illegal and can land you in prison if you get caught with one. Needless to say, we won't be getting to know many of those insignificant souls down there. Our story is up where the real action is. The recurring theme of the show is corruption in high places. In the first episode, and thus the original film, 
Edison is after what appears to be a hot story of a man dying under utterly weird circumstances. But somebody at the network doesn't want him to investigate, and Edison is nearly killed when his control goes on a break and leaves him dangling. Curious at the situation, Carter goes back to the station and fires his control with his fists. His new control is Theora Jones, played by Amanda Pays. Carter likes her instantly, partly because she's both brilliant with the computer and serious about doing her job the best she possibly can, and partly because she's uh, quite attractive. But there's no time for that. What he'll discover is his own network caused it. Bryce Lynch, a teenage computer genius that the CEO keeps locked up in a lab on the supposedly non-existent 13th floor, has invented a way to compress a 30-second commercial into three seconds. He calls them blipverts. Edison breaks into Bryce's inner sanctum and discovers the terrible truth. If you're a major couch potato like this man was, too much stimulation of the electrical signals in the brain from these compressed commercials can make this happen. Network 13's corrupt CEO won't pull the blipverts even though they're killing people because if he does, their biggest advertiser will pull their money. While Edison is trying to get to the bottom of this, his own network security guards are trying to take him down. Theora and Bryce are having a computer battle with the building systems, she to try and get him out, he to try and keep him in. That's when this happens. He's still alive, but in a coma. Our CEO wants to know how much he discovered, so the kid sets up a program and downloads Edison Carter's memory into the computer. 20 minutes into the future, somebody figured out how to do that. That block of memory forms itself into Max Headroom. He names himself that because those were the last words that Edison Carter saw before he crashed. Max immediately starts acting like an independent entity instead of just telling the boss what he wants to know. Max Headroom absorbed one aspect of Edison Carter's personality more than the others. He's a smartass. The show also stars Jeffrey Tambor, an actor I've always liked. I got introduced to him through a short-lived sitcom called Mr. Sunshine, in which he played a blind teacher. The show itself wasn't very good, but he was. Mr. Sunshine only ran for 11 episodes, whereas this one got 14. Talk about moving up in the world. One of the strangest things about this show was it's almost impossible to pin down what Max Headroom himself is all about. He moves freely about the inner recesses of Network 23, can alter programming, break into a single screen and talk to you from your TV set, but mostly what he does is try to figure out what's the deal with this ridiculous TV show he's found himself in. He has no idea there's a real world out here. He thinks everything is a TV show. At times that seems like his motivation, other times it seems like he's just out to cause havoc for the fat cats for no other reason than he can. He wasn't a very well-defined character, and I think that may have been part of the reason the show failed. I would think it's hard to make a truly coherent story when the guy you've said is your main character is little more than a heckler from the audience. The general public are addicted to television. Without it, they don't know what to do. In the fifth episode, a slimy politician is having blanks arrested and jailed just for not being in the central computer banks. A hacker who's a blank comes up with a way to kill all 10,000 channels so there's nothing to watch. He stages a little demonstration and the people lose their minds. If the TV stayed off any longer, there'd be riots. The hacker demands that all blanks be released or he'll kill television forever. In this world, no television is a fate worse than no chocolate. I wasn't exaggerating, by the way. Sorry to bother you, Benny. Uh, can we call this fringe time once upon a time? The, the dead hour just before prime time? Before we had 10,000 channels? Yes, I remember. In one episode, we see what happens when one company is in charge of security for the whole world. And what happens when that company puts an AI in charge. And what happens when that AI goes rogue and decides Edison Carter is its enemy. In that instance, Max comes in handy, and he's definitely a charmer. You know, I've never been accessed like this before. 
I'll be gentle. <laughs> you say the nicest things. I have a strange compulsion to hug you. Max, you're making me lose control. I just want to surrender. If I show any more of that, I'll get demonetized. If there's a running theme in this show, it's how the big guys walk all over the little guys and get away with it. This city has body banks. Bodies are frozen and stored here for organ harvesting later. Because what could go wrong with that? When a young girl is kidnapped and a friend goes to Carter to try and find out what happened to her, Edison starts digging and uncovers a gruesome secret at the body bank. <laughs> Let's see if she's got what we need. They're stealing people, Mr. Carter. Stealing bodies. Ever since he switched sides in the first episode, Bryce uses his computer brilliance to help Edison track down who's doing what and where he needs to go to get the story. But Bryce isn't your average whiz kid. His view of life is a little different than most people's. Most memories are the random retrieval of normally superfluous data. A waste of real time. I try to bulk erase mine daily. I tried to redirect Nicholas, but but he's a poorly designed system. What system? A system that allows him to be better off by keeping quiet. I mean, what good is a system if it doesn't work properly? In the seventh episode, we learn why he's like that. It's how he was taught to be. Network 23 isolates brilliant children early and puts them in this special academy where they teach them to be what they hope are the best hackers on the planet. Bryce entered the academy when he was 10. They also teach the kids that life is little more than a simple computer exercise with everything binary, yes or no, in or out, on or off, and there are no gray areas like morality or emotions. We instill the morality of binary absolutes here, Mr. Carter. The useful consequence of pure logic is the divine simplicity of a yes, no decision about everything. Well, what about right and wrong? I noticed you said responsible party, not guilty. Oh, gray areas, quite useless to a computer specialist. We don't deal in guilt. We deal in information. That is why the appropriate party will be with us shortly. You will see. You're really not compiling this, are you, Nicholas? You did it. Blank Reg didn't. Facts. Give me credit, Bryce. I've got it all worked out. And I'm sure your procedures are impeccable, but you're using the wrong formula. This is how they talk to each other. Since there's no such thing as morality, some of these kids have been hacking into the network and causing problems, costing the network millions. They're doing it to prove they can, and since there's no such thing as right and wrong, it doesn't matter as long as it serves some utilitarian purpose in their minds. Talking about that kid's brain as though it's a computer program is how Bryce has to try and get through to him. Basically, the network strips these kids of their humanity and turns them into thinking robots. There are no experimental failures. There's only more data. Under Edison and Theora's influence, Bryce is starting to understand that he's more than a collection of on-off switches and that things like right and wrong do exist. More importantly, they're things he has to learn to deal with. Speaking of morality, who are the guardians of the public trust in that area? You have quite enough to deal with in news and entertainment events. Let's leave religion to the televangelists. After all, they're the professionals. Okay, the question is, the professional what? Without the turn to save himself, Network 23's weekly broadcast of the New Age Church, the modern religion for the video age. Thank you. Thank you. Your church has been at the forefront of resurrection research. But resurrection is a very costly process and requires your donations. I don't know why I'm not surprised. In terms of airtime and ad rates, View Age is bigger than Islam, Judaism, IBM, Scientology, and all but two Christian nominations. Projections indicate that they will pass the Catholics and the 700 Club by this time next year. It's nice to know that both the 700 Club and IBM survived as viable religions. It turns out she's telling people she can preserve their consciousness in a state much like Max Headroom, then in the future when we learn how to grow new bodies, they can be reunited with their loved ones. Except she doesn't have anything like the computing power necessary to do that to thousands of people, so it's a big fraud. We see people talking to other people on screens, but the people on the screens don't seem to have much personality. 
That's because all she did was make a construct of their face, plug in a few random words and phrases, and then tell the mark that they're talking to their dear departed. In another episode, a company is stealing people's dreams so that they can launch a channel where you experience other people's dreams. Except the extraction process is killing people, sucking the life out of them. But in this world, profit is God and people are demographics, so losing a couple of folks from the fringes is no big deal. That's the world Edison Carter finds himself fighting, even though that world is what keeps him in a job. The dominant corporation, at least in the show, is a Japanese company called Zigzag. It's unclear exactly what they do or make, because every time you hear about them, it seems we're plugging something different. Zigzag. A quick word of thanks. To the real sponsors. You. Yes, you. You buy their products, you give them their profits, so you're sponsoring the game. The game that is actually a giant commercial for Zigzag. Zigzag says, thank you, thank you, and please buy more products, give them more profits, and sponsor more games. They seem to make all the food, especially the junk food, but they also make this thing. Get one free with every purchase at your local Zigzag outlet. What does it do for you? That. It makes your greatest fantasies come true in your mind. I wonder if she realizes she was sitting too close to the surf so he's grabbing a wet sandy butt. But all of a sudden, pretty much simultaneous with the release of that newer stem bracelet, sales of all the rest of their products shot up exponentially. I wonder why. Controlling people's impulses is another running theme in this show. In one, a ridiculous game show called Wackets has people so hooked they can't stop watching. And they can't stop watching because there's a subliminal program in it that releases all their endorphins and makes them feel wonderful. So wonderful they're addicted to it and can't stop. It even sends Max off the rails for a while. So we can steal your dreams and suck all the life out of you, or we can make you watch the stupidest program ever made, or we can give you a free bracelet that makes you buy tons of junk and eat yourself into a coma. There's lots of things the elite can do with the people down on the fringes who have nothing else to do but watch television. Needless to say, they predicted the massive income gap that we see today 30 years before it happened. And we're headed toward the rest of it if we don't wake up soon. Their justice system is based on ratings just like everything else. All rise for the most highly rated judge. He'll decide if you go to court. If you do, a studio audience on a game show decides whether you're innocent or guilty based on what they think of your performance as well as your probable record. But what if you don't have a record? What if you're a blank like our friend Reg here? Previous criminal activities. They can't have any files on me. I've been off the records for years. The network police ran a computer investigation. They say the probability is you committed these crimes. Oh, probability. Yes, Dominique. If the probability computes, and in cases where there's no evidence, they work on the probability. Nice, huh? You're presumed guilty based on what a computer thinks of your personality as compared against various crimes and infractions. This whole unbelievable world they've created looks terrifyingly possible now. Including this. Do you realize that six companies control all the information you receive, whether through cable TV, newspapers, radio, skywriting, your gossipy next door neighbor, whatever? If just six CEOs got together, they could control all of us. That's a single example drawn from the real world and it's a mite terrifying. The Max Headroom world takes that situation to the nth degree. I've watched all the episodes multiple times now, and for the life of me, I have no idea who ZigZag is competing against that they have to do all this advertising. You never hear another major company mentioned. Are they it? It seems like it at times, but we're not supposed to care about that. We're supposed to be focused on the things Edison Carter cares about, like truth and how the big networks hide it, manipulate it, and otherwise keep the bulk of the raw information from us so they can get better ratings. To see that situation, we don't need to go 20 minutes into the future. But in this world, it's worse than that. We couldn't do a show about a dystopian TV-dominated future without talking about censorship. And we did. 
exactly one episode right near the end of the series. The topic had never come up before and never came up again, but ostensibly they've been dealing with the censorship situation all along. But what are they censoring and why? Edison kind of falls into the answer when he's visiting his friends Reg and Dom on the fringes and witnesses a raid on a subversive cell of revolutionaries. These radical anarchists are teaching children to read. They're using some educational tapes that they pirated from our very own Network 23, and Dracula's poorer cousin doesn't like it. Kids have the right to knowledge, Philistine. Not if it is stolen property. That tape is pirated from the pay education TV. If these vermin want it, they should pay for it like everybody else. With what, man? You've closed the circle. No pay, no learning, no pay. You've stolen our right to know! Words are much too valuable to be free. If you were educated, you would know that. That's right. If your family has enough money to subscribe to Network 23's pay education service, you too can learn to read. If not, you're not that important anyway, so forget it. If you were educated, you would know that. No, we never get to see anything happen to him. Needless to say, Edison and Theora think that's an unacceptable situation and Edison starts investigating. Most of his investigation gets censored. When things start coming to a head, we find out who the real censors are. I said, hold it! Chief, what have Metro cops to do with censorship? B, C, orders. From where? Wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that a computer ordered all this? Yes. To expose all this, Edison needs Bryce to shut down the censoring computer. Can you neutralize the censor computer? <laughs> Edison, I designed it. If you were educated, you would know that. Pretty much that whole complex where we spend our days is Bryce's creation. But as Edison's interactions with various people demonstrate, sometimes you need the whiz kid, and sometimes you need the street smart blank on the fringes. Reg and Dom are a case study in themselves. They run a low-power TV station that they broadcast out of a pink bus they also live in. They're not a couple, at least not in the traditional sense of the word, and it's really hard to pin down their relationship. Dom, or Dominique if we go with her full name, is the wannabe glamour of the operation. She spends what seems like hours fussing with her hair and makeup, smokes her cigarettes on a long fancy holder like FDR used to use, and one time when she had a meeting at a fancy restaurant with the head of Network 66, she showed up like this. Hello, Mr. Grossberg. Yes, Dominique, at last we meet. Reg, on the other hand, is perfectly happy just the way he is. Oh, Dom, that's the first time you've ever had your arms around me. Oh, Reggie, darling. Oh, about your personal hygiene. When somebody comes a calling, their philosophy is mi casa es su casa. Ow! <laughs> most of the time. Speaking of Network 66, that executive that Dom dressed up for, he was the guy behind Network 23's blitverts in the first episode. His name is Grossberg and after he's fired from 23, he manages to lie, cheat, and manipulate his way to the top of Network 66. And he's determined to sink 23 for what they did to him. He even tries to lure Bryce away. No, I want you to form a team of the most brilliant minds in network television. Well, now, isn't that a contradiction in terms? Spoiler, when Bryce finds out what kinds of shady things Grossberg is doing, he declines the offer. That's right, I spoiled the least significant part of the story. By contrast, Network 23's new CEO, Ben Cheviot, tries to be a decent person and retain his humanity while also retaining ratings. It's often a difficult dance for him, but he pulls it off most of the time. The stories themselves and even the insane world they're set in had possibilities. We had a good cast of characters, both good and evil. And the addition of Max as a novelty no other show had should have increased the show's popularity. So why didn't it? I think one reason is just bad directing. 
we get what seems like hours of B-roll footage of extras standing around the barrels and all the rest, each person we see just a little weirder than the previous one. We waste loads of time on long shots of the Network 23 building in the middle of the city. We get lots of moving shots like this where we're looking through some barrier and can only partially see the action, if you can call that action. I think we're trying to be artistic in our depiction of dystopia, but it ends up just looking like the camera operator was lost. And too much of the time, Max Headroom is like this. Reproduction. You see, God may have made man in his own image, but woman he definitely made from a do-it-yourself kit. All those valves, buttons, nozzles, all that just for producing children. Most of his comments are extraneous and off the subject. The idea, I think, is supposed to be that he's trying to figure everything out, he's like a baby exploring his new world, but he comes off as rude. To put it bluntly, he's not an enjoyable character. With rare exceptions, the stories would stand much better without it. It's really not even funny when he does something like this. <laughs> and I'm gonna be back with you on Network 23 after these real, 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 really exciting messages. So, so sit back and watch. I just can't wait, 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 wait to see them. <laughs> Wake me up when they're finished, will you? Part of the reason it's not funny is because he says something along those lines before at least one commercial break in almost every episode. When you start repeating gags, you're out of material. Overall, I think the show was just too weird for 1987-88 audiences. I watched it because I was starting to get interested in computers and Max Headroom was computer generated as far as I knew way back when we didn't have the internet to find out otherwise. But honestly, when it disappeared, I didn't miss it. I think that pretty well says it. I'm Irving, and I'll see you next time on Single Shots. If you were educated, you would know that.